will be. So, without any further ado, Mike from Glue is going to talk to us about uh, identity in the cloud. Hi, thanks everyone. Let me switch back. So this is a talk um, I gave at RSA Security, and it's on authentication. So just a quick show of hands, how many people use two-factor authentication to get to their email? <laughs> so so um, this talk is going to be about um, the variety of two-factor authentication uh, mechanisms we have, and also about some of the challenges and why why we're not why everyone is not using stronger authentication than passwords. So it's it's a basic talk, um, and the the basic problem with authentication is there's sort of a disconnect between the physical world and the digital world. So I I, I started with this slide. What um, for the first time a president actually mentioned two-factor authentication, sort of. Um, he didn't say exactly two-factor authentication, but he sort of alluded to it. And he, he talked about how we really need to do something better than passwords. Um, and he mentioned fingerprints or code sent to your cell phone, which I'm not going to necessarily endorsing. But the, um, the problem with authentication um, is that, you know, in the... How do we know who the person is on that other, um, on the other side of that stream of electrons? So when you go to a website, you're not physically presenting yourself. You're basically a stream of electrons, and figuring out which person is on the other side of that stream of electrons is really challenging. In around 1984, um, William Gibson wrote this book called Neuromancer, and he gave. So if cyberspace is the digital world, he actually gave a name to this other world that we walk around in, and he called it the meat space, where, where pieces of meat walk around and do meat-like things. So we have um, a number of ways to bridge. If we have this piece of meat in front of us, we have a couple of ways to bridge this. Um, some of you might recognize these things. Um, this is up on Pioneer Farms, um, where, I, where I volunteer on the weekends. And she has a little tag on her ear, and it's an RFID tag, and we can scan that and we know who she is. Um, and my dog um, has a chip in the back of her neck. This is um, when we adopted her. And um, I have pigeons. So when pigeons race, I don't know if you know people race pigeons, but when they, when you do race them, you can put an RFID tag on them. When they come home, they scan over the clock. So Disney said, this is a great idea. We can tag animals. Why don't we tag people at the park? <laughs> so they introduced these new um, bands, where it, which they said, well, we can track them if they go to our website. We can tag them with cookies. And how can we do that in the park? I want to, we want to know, we, we know what web page they're visiting. We want to know how long they spend at each ride and what um, concessions they go to. So they created these things and they call them basically meat cookies um, so they can track you in the meat space. And South by Southwest, a lot of you might have, if you attended the conference, you might notice that they're scanning your tag. So South by is doing the same thing. Um, so those are all strategies when we actually have the piece of meat in front of us and we're trying to make that digital meat um, translation. But in for websites or mobile, we actually the, the, the connection to the person actually happens over the network. So there are some additional challenges that we have with identifying the person. So this talk is sort of like a survey of the strategies we have for remote authentication. And um, I start with um, sort of the ones you know about, um, and then I talk about some other strategies that we have. Um, the reason why you should care about this, before I go any further, is if you look at the root cause of, like, of about 80% of the breaches, it's passwords. Um, so this is obviously a problem. I'm always um, really like sort of amused by the fact that we spend so much money on detection and so little money on prevention. 
Um, so hopefully um, you'll um, you'll maybe give this talk might give you some ideas about some things you can do. So passwords, you know, much maligned. Um, um, this is the the traditional um, um, strategy for identifying a person. Um, this is a little, people have so many passwords that they forget their passwords for different sites. So you can actually have this little, um, um, it, it, it enables you to um, store all your passwords and carry it around in your wallet in case you forget. Um, and then phone authentication, uh, my bank sends me an SMS code when I use a new browser, um, that's pretty common. Um, you are, uh, if you're a Rackspace employee, you probably have one of these. Any Rackspace employees here? You still have one? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, this is OTP. It, there's a little chip in there. It gives you a different code. You put in a PIN number plus a little code. It lets you log in. It's a one-step, um, one-time password authentication. So this has been around for um, for quite some time, probably 15, 20 years. Um, and um, yeah, it was cracked. Um, and you have, um, um, you might have used Google Authenticator, um, so it's a similar idea, um, give you a mobile app, gives you an OTP code. Um, and some of you might have smart cards. Anyone have a smart card? Yeah, so um, these have been around for some time. It used to be really easy to like counterfeit cards. Um, and then they said, let's put a chip on it, let's put some crypto on it, we're gonna make it much harder. So smart cards have been around, um, you know, for a long time too, um, and um, not so easy to deploy um, or issue them, but they're there. Um, cert authentication. This is something a lot of people don't know about. This is where we can push a like a, a certificate, a digital certificate, to your browser, and you can use that that um, certificate in your browser as an extra something. Anyone using um, um, browser cert authentication at all? Yeah, so it's out there. So, okay, so those are sort of like the, when, when I started in the business, those were the, the, the most uh, well-known authentication mechanisms. And the, what I get asked mostly, mo the most frequent question I get asked is, isn't biometric gonna solve it all? Like. And so we have a lot of techniques around biometric authentication. Um, fingerprint, um, this is a, if you follow this link, it shows you a video of somebody swiping their cat's paw and opening their iPhone. Um, so biometrics sort of have this trade-off. You can make them really sensitive, and in which case they're really accurate, but the usability is terrible. Or you can make them really insensitive, in which case the usability goes way up um, but the security goes way down. Um, so there's there's a sort of trade-off in biometrics. Um, so fingerprint, not that accurate. Um, um, there's a new technology for nano fingerprint where they get like a 3D image, like um, think about an electron version, electron microscope version of your fingerprint. So this is coming out and that's supposed to be better, not available. I think I saw this at a cloud meetup um, but this thing is looks like a fingerprint reader, but it actually uses sonic technology. It takes a 3D image of your whole finger. Um, so, and it's not that expensive. So this is another good, um, um, maybe we'll see it make its way into hardware pretty soon. Um, Fuji released, it might have been Fuji, maybe it's Hitachi, um, released um, this technology um, you sort of put your finger, this is used in ATMs, I think, in Korea, but it scans your finger and looks at the veins in your finger, so it's not looking at your fingerprint. Um, your whole palm, um, this is, I don't, I've never seen this, but um, I think we had a data center where we were using palm authentication like uh, that I visited once. Um, so facial recognition is really interesting because there's so many different algorithms that it's really hard to trick it because you don't know what it's looking at. It could be looking at the geometry of your of your eyes and your nose. It could there's one that looks at your skin texture. Um, it could be um, it's really hard to spoof it because you don't, you might not know how to spoof it. Um, voice authentication. Um, voice is an interesting biometric because it expires in about six months. It needs to be constantly retrained. So 
Um, the, the one privacy consideration that exists with biometric is that, and not with other mechanisms, is that you can't change your biometrics. Um, so if somebody steals your password, you can change your password, but if they steal your fingerprint, what are you gonna do? Um, so there's an extra privacy consideration around, around biometrics. Voice is sort of interesting because it has a built-in um, um, expiration date. Um, the one thing that's sort of creepy about voice is that a number of countries like New Zealand and, and Australia have collected biometric databases of citizens' voices without telling them. Um, so, and then, and then they suddenly disclose we have millions of, uh, we have a database of millions of biometrics um, of, of citizens and it sort of creep people out. Um, another interesting thing about voice is it's low tech. Um, question, are you just stretching? Yeah. So, so a lot of um, biometrics need to be retrained, and voice is like is the one that needs to be retrained the, mo the most. So they need to get a sample of you talking, and then over time your voice changes more than you think. So after six months, it loses its accuracy. Um, so, um, so one of these articles, by, so all of these links, um, you, you'll be able to see them on my slides. I made short links in case you want to write them down, but the first link is, um, oh no, the second link um, is a link to an article about, about voice authentication in Africa. Um, so I always, whenever I see anything in Africa, I'm in, interested because it seems like they, they might be some out of the box thinking about you know, technology. But what's interesting about voice is that the sensors needed on the phone are available even in feature phones. Like not a smartphone, but like a dumb, you know, a featureless phone, like the old phones. Those have a microphone in them. So it's sort of an interesting biometric because there's a low um, threshold for hardware. Um, lip authentication. This one takes video, and the way that you um, talk um, is unique. Um, eye authentication. Um, so the iris is is pretty unique. Um, it could be looking at your veins. Actually, Android has eye vein authentication built into the software and can use um, the front, the camera, the front facing camera. I think that's in the newest uh, Android. Um, this idea of iris authentication isn't new. Going back to the pigeon business, like if you buy an expensive pigeon, you get a picture like this and we, we can know like that, yes, that's the pigeon that I bought. Um, Ear authentication, I used to joke about this. I used to say, you know, I have my phone, I put my phone to my ear, it's perfect. Um, and then not one, but two, I saw two articles about it. Um, and um, your heart, this one's sort of interesting because it's passive. Um, so your heart rhythm is unique. Um, so it's sort of, this one's uh, sort of interesting because maybe you go into your car and your car's like, okay, it's you, I'm turning on. Um, and by the way, Apple um, is patent. Apple's been filing tons of patents in the authentication area. And so they, they patented this one um, and a couple others. Um, so we'll see some fights in this. Um, you have a unique thermal image. Um, so... This is a MIT technology. Um, you actually have a microbial aura that's unique. There's actually a bunch of things living and swarming around you. And by walking through a sensor, they can detect your unique microbial aura. Um, so this is my new joke, and this will probably come true, but I actually think that it would be cool if I could just take my phone and put it under my arm and, and it knows who I am. So, coming soon. And I will say that my dog, who I bought um, at, for, I think I paid $25 for her, and she knows it's me. It can be pitch black, and I walk into the room, and she knows it's me 100% of the time. So her sensors are very inexpensive, although at high operating cost. <laughs> um, so brain authentication, this one I thought was also totally w a whack, you know, I was, I was practically joking. And then I added one link and I actually found one. And then I found another one. And today I, it's going off the screen. There's a third one down there. Um, so, and, and they're getting progressively more serious about this. 
Um, so, and then, um, okay, this, this one I don't understand. Um, and it's funny because, oh, oh no, no, I don't I Actually, I'll have to get back to that one. Now, th now this one I do understand. Okay, so um, what's interesting about biometrics is that um, they say that in authentication, there's no way to really know it's you. It's all about risk mitigation. I want to mitigate the risk that it's not you. I'm never actually really sure that it's you. If there were any easy solutions for biometric authentication, then the FBI would not have just opened a biometric center with a thousand employees to try and figure this out. Um, this isn't a problem where some college, you know, um, graduate student is going to think about some cool solution. If it was possible um, over the last like 30 years or so, it would have been done already. So my actual opinion about this is that um, actually biometrics doesn't mitigate that much risk of misidentification and that it won't ever be a good biometric authentication mechanism, but biometrics will be used in combinations with other factors to mitigate risk, but by itself, I don't think it's really um, ever going to happen. Um, although there's one slide at the end where, where somebody will argues with that. but So, okay, so that's a something. If you go to the NIST 863 definition of like two-factor authentication, the definition you get is something you are, something you know, something you have. So that is the something that you are. Biometrics is a something that you are. Um, the something that you know is actually a really good um, trick. So, um, so passwords aren't the only way to figure out something that we know. So we have images. Um, so this one, it came out of Japan. Um, the clip art is for real. Um, and you pick like these, this pattern and, and it, it identifies you. This one is, you take a picture of, some, of an object you own and then it presents you with a bunch of objects and you can just pick out, you say, okay, that's my iPod. And um, this is another similar image one. Um, you would touch a couple of places, like you touch the face, the wheel, you know, the knee. Uh, and they say if you touch four places, it's like 72-bit authentication, whatever that means. Um, and this one is sort of crazy. It comes from South Africa. You learn a pattern. So you'd, put, you'd, you'd basically look at the screen and you know your pattern and you put those patterns in as, as, as the passcode and they keep changing the numbers. So these are all cognitive. This one is actually for real. It's used by a bank in North Carolina and it's rhythm authentication. You tap, You're, I guess you have a microphone and it's, you know, or something like, I bet you have a lot of like similar passwords. Um, so, okay, so, the, so you know, well, I'll, I'll save that comment. So let's go to the next one. So wearables are cool. Um, we have a lot of new wearables because um, these things are getting really cheap. Um, these are NFC tags. Or, um, and what's interesting about them is that they're not just readable like R RFID tags, they're writable. Um, so we can have some interesting authentication mechanisms where we rotate um, the token in them, which makes which can make them more secure. Um, and we have watches, and the watches are great. Something you have um, this one. This one I just added this slide yesterday. Jacket authentication. Um, I guess jackets are really expensive now, and and they they're digital. Um, ring authentication. Um, I call this one bling authentication. This guy, he he put it like a chip inside the pearl, so your your necklace could be your authenticator. Bra authentication. Thank the guys at Microsoft for this one. Um, now this this is for real pill authentication. You swallow a pill, and it's good for 24 hours of authentication. Yes. How much you ate? This is another uh, Motorola one, um, Tattoo. Um, so um, this is being looked at as a um, alternative to military dog tags. And wobble authentication. So actually, like, the way that you walk, your gait, so if you put a camera on, a, on somebody, it becomes very, uh, it's good for identification of that per who that person is. 
Um, or, um, for example, um, I think glasses, you know, like Google Glasses, maybe that's going to evolve. Um, but that type of thing, either in your contact lens, this is a Google project, by the way, the Google contact lens, um, or Google Glass is going to be um, um, very good for identification. Your glasses are, are really unique, like your prescription. There's a lot of things, and you're not going to lose your glasses. Um, when I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I'm going for. Um, so, so, okay, let's go to tokens. So tokens is like the oldest trust model there is. Um, this is a picture of St. Peter. Um, so note, um, he's getting the key. Um, that key is, you know, it's identifying him. It's actually sort of interesting because the key is St. Peter's identity. Like whenever you see a guy with a key, that's St. Peter. So it's, all, it's his access control and it's his identifier. Um, but really it's, um, one other thing I'll just sort of like hassle the painter about is that that key, that type of key, um, was invented around the year 1000. So there's no way Jesus could have given him that key. Um, it would have been a wooden key. Um, but um, anyway, but this trust model, like I'm going to give you something and that's going to prove that you're you. This is a biblical like trust model. It's that old. So it's, but now we have some better keys. Um, so FIDO um, authentication. Um, so this is FIDO as a standard. Um, so there used to be all these proprietary keys like RSA tokens. And now um, one, one thing is like, okay, well, RSA tokens have a battery. The battery wears out every three years. It dies. So every three years, you have a 30% replacement cost on tokens. Every three years, you need to get a new token. Why do we need a battery and a token? Um, we have a power source in the computer. Let's just use that. We'll just put the crypto on the token. And then it raises the question, well, why are everybody's tokens going to be different? Can't we have one standard token? So that's basically what FIDO did, is they made a standard for USB tokens. Um, they have another standard for biometric authentication. Um, these, this is the token you've probably seen, the YubiKey. Um, Sort of complicated. YubiKey has more than just U2F on there. They have a OTP standard. They have smart card. They have a bunch of stuff on there. But the, 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 it's the best known U2F token. It's sort of become the brand of U2F. Like if they show you an icon of U2F, they show you a YubiKey. Um, I have this little one. Um, this little one's really cool. I keep it on a fishing swivel because I don't know if you put, actually insert it into your, um, USB. I don't know how you're supposed to get it out. Um, so be careful with that one. That, that hole is really small. Um, but there's other kinds of U2F tokens. This one I love, it's six dollars. And the, and the one at the top is ten dollars. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, and I've tested all these with Google and uh, with, with my company's product. They all work perfectly. I actually like this one the best. Like this one is really cool because, um, first of all, I can mail it to employees. Um, for about a dollar fifty, I take it, I put it in a regular postal envelope and put a stamp on it. And I can, you can mail a letter anywhere in the world for like a dollar fifty from the United States. So instead of like sending them like a DHL package for a hundred bucks, uh, it, it, it's really great. Um, don't throw out, it says fold, don't throw that thing out. And the first thing I did was I folded it out, I threw it away. I'm like, oh, I don't need that. No, that's because this thing is not big enough to go in a USB. You need to make it thicker. So you fold it over on itself. So you keep that little red tab. Um, but um, yeah, so they're they're getting at six dollars. It's sort of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the way that we use it with the glue server is it's a it's a second factor. So in the first step, you put in your username and password. And then in the second step, it says insert your USB, your Yubi key. So you just, in, as step two, you just put in the key, it reads it, and you're, you take it out, and you're done. Um, so if it has a button, like that one has a button, in step two, you insert it, and you press the button. Um, sometimes you might want to leave it in, and then suppress it multiple times. So I actually prefer this one, because it feels like a key to me. Inserting it is like pressing the button. Um, but the um, UB key also has a button. So, but it's basically, it's always done as a two-step authentication. Step one is, is, is password. Step two is t token. Many of the tokens 
No. Yes. Yeah, these are just, um, there's actually a, the way that it works technically is um, there's a private key and a, and a public key on the token. And when you enroll the, the token, it registers the public key. And then when you authenticate, there's a challenge response, which proves that you have control of the private key on the token. So it's, a, it's basically a, a, a USB interface for public-private key authentication. So it's a fancy key, really. It really is. Um, so this one is also U2F. It's called Nitro Key. And the reason I point this one out is because it's open hardware. So if that's important to you and you really want to know what's in that thing, like, for example, um, this one's made in China, that little white one. It's made in China. So some people would say Chinese security is like an oxymoron. You know, no, we're not going to use a Chinese token. Um, so you don't know what's in there, right? Maybe it's sending your private key to China. Um, but, um, but this one is made in Germany, and it is open hardware, so you could know exactly what's in there. So I highly encourage you to support Nitro Key. Um, unfortunately, it's more expensive and it's bigger. Um, yeah, it is a U2F token. Yeah, the same thing. Yeah, we try all, we've tried every single key out there. They all work fine. Yes, in fact, mm -hmm. so um, um, the Chinese company has a Bluetooth token that's coming out, and I haven't gotten it yet. They're going to send it to me, but uh, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. No, um, and um, um, it would it would be very it would be a lot of work to tamper with one of them, um, but uh, no. There's no, um, uh, so this is one of the advantages of smart cards is that there's more integrity built into the issuance of the card. Um, but smart cards are, you can't buy it on Amazon for six bucks. So um, this is a Google project. It's a whole like Linux operating system on a, on a um, SD card. Um, all, same idea uh, about um, it's a something you have. Um, this isn't really available yet, but I, I saw it and it seemed cool. It's an, it's an SD card. It's not USB. Um, so if you have something that you can put an SD card into. Um, so, okay, so that, that's sort of tokens. There's more tokens. Actually, uh, I don't know, one of my slides fell out. There, there's still, R, there's, in addition to our, um, RSA tokens, there's a bunch of other OTP tokens. Um, so, every, so after biometrics, everyone says to me that, that this thing should be your authenticator. Like, why do I need to carry around a token? I have one of these things. I always know where it is. Um, I will say, this thing is a battery hog. My token doesn't have a battery power source, so it never runs out of battery, and this I have to keep charging. Um, but yeah, this is a if this is the best token ever made. It knows where I woke up in the morning, what route I took to work. It has so much contextual information about me. It's very hard for me to deny that I didn't have control of this thing. If, I, if, if the FBI comes and picks you up and they grab your phone and you authenticate it with that phone, you're going to have a hard time denying it was you. Um, so the phone also has tons of sensors and tons of um, um, interfaces. Um, so th this, this is IBM technology. Um, if you like to leave on NFC, which I don't, it kills my battery. But if you did, you could use it for door access. Um, and this one, um, so this type of authentication, um, it records, it uses the microphone to record the ambient sound in your area, and it can use that to authenticate you. Um, gesture authentication, you know, I, this is, um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of cool, like, ways. I, I, that's, I don't know, that, I guess that's his password. Um, <laughs> but you could swipe. Um, actually, um, you could make a certain like type of swivel with your mouse, so you could use some type of movement basically that gets converted to digital. Um, or this one is like gyro authentication. You could like sign your name in the air, um, and that could be your your password. Um, bio. So this company. Um, is um, they combine biometrics with mobile information and look at all the contextual stuff and they, they authenticate you. It's called Maxim ID. 
um, QR codes. QR codes are just a font. So I don't know why people think that, like I get a lot of this, people show me their QR code authentication. It's not really the QR code that makes any difference. That's just like normally a URL. But normally the QR code kicks off a process, an interaction between your phone um, and um, the server. And it's your phone that's being identified. The QR code is just really the bridge to get to the server. Um, so Duo Security, we really like. They have a PAM plugin, which is great for SSH login, um, which I think is better. It's an out of band. It's better than um, you know certificate authentication from from the um, SSH. So um, if you want to lock down your servers, it's a cool thing. Um, there's also great for web authentication. Um, basically, um, Duo, um, when you authenticate, it'll send. It'll either call you. Um, on the phone, it'll send you a text message, or if you have the mobile app installed, it'll send you a message. It'll say, this person's trying to log in from this IP address and geolocation. It's a commercial service. Um, launch, launch pad, or launch key, rather, um, is another SaaS um, authentication service provider. Um, it gives you the location. Um, so you can geofence. You can say, if I'm at home, don't prompt me for a password, or don't prompt me for the mobile out of band. Um, Tosni, another mobile authentication SaaS provider. Um, that slides out of out of sequence. So you can have um, either put a crypto element in your phone as an SD card, um, or you can build it into the phone itself. And this is this would be the equivalent of a smart card. So the government's really interested in this because um, it it meets the security requirements for level four authentication. It's basically as good as a smart card. Um, here's my pitch for Glue. Um, so my company is a free open source product. We built this um, two-factor authentication. It sort of looks like Duo. Um, it sends you a notification out of band. You can also scan a QR code. So one of the things that annoyed us about two-factor is that they all cost money. And we said, well, can't we have, have, what do we recommend to our customers that they can use something better than passwords that doesn't cost money? Because companies were, passwords were free. So you go to your boss and you're like, well, we used to have these passwords for free, and now we got to pay for authentication. That doesn't fly. So that what we felt was one of the barriers. So we released this um, a free authentication mechanism, and we call it Superglue. And everybody loves that name. So, um, OK, geofencing. What your near can authenticate you. So you have your phone. You have your Bluetooth earpiece. You have your other Bluetooth devices. You're in your car. Your proximity to certain devices can be used to identify you. I'm going to go faster because we're, OK, your phone has a lot of data on you. What apps you use. You played Clash of Clans. You send text messages. You use Telegram. That profile of usage um, identifies you. And this is more about identifying who's not you. But if somebody were to maybe use your phone with a different profile of usage, we could um, figure it out. Um, and what else? OK. All right, good. We're wrapping up. Here are the really weird ones, if those weren't weird enough. Um, well, this one's HTML5 authentication. It actually just didn't fit into any of the categories. I couldn't figure out where to put it. Um, but it's called InWebo. And they have a plugin, and, and it's sort of interesting. There's a browser plugin, or this is an HTML5 one. Um, open creds, this is an open source project um, which is using JSON LD linked data um, to, it's really going to be a web based authentication type, but it's, it's like using linked data to store your credentials on the, to store credentials on the web. And it's using private public key. Um, this is the one that I don't understand. It's quantum authentication. And this is the only authentication mechanism where I've heard them claim that they'll be 100% sure that it's you. And it somehow uses like your quantum data. And I don't, I, I don't know enough about physics to understand it, but you can follow that link and find out how they know for sure it's you or how they're going to get that sensor into your phone. And um, OK, I'll just go, keep going, Google. Um, so OK, so the one thing I want to impress on you is that if you think that people aren't using two-factor authentication, it's not for lack of mechanisms. So if you think 
you've solved, if you think you have thought of some new clever way to authenticate somebody, do not file a patent, do not start a company, passwords are not the problem. There must be some other problem because we have a million ways, literally, to authenticate people or to identify them. So Microsoft did this study, see if it zooms in, yeah. And they basically, it's a research of research study, and they looked at all the different types of authentication, you know, cognitive, um, mobile, um, phone-based, and they sort of rated them for usability, deployability, and security. And what they found is that there are many types of authentication that have better usability. This is a no-brainer. Everyone hates passwords, right? So it's definitely better usability. Um, security, yeah, the security on passwords are terrible. That's not a very high bar. So we definitely have mechanisms that are more usable and more secure. However, none of the mechanisms are more deployable. Um, so this, this is basically the, the conclusion is that, yes, they're, they're more secure, they're easier to use, but there's some other problem around passwords that's stopping us from using um, something better than passwords. And this says marginal gains are not sufficient. Um, by the way, all those cognitive methods were no better than passwords. <laughs> so, um, okay, so how do we get over this deployability problem? And here's where I think we need standards. Um, and because if you're gonna make the investment in two-factor authentication, you have to get a return on that investment in a lot of applications. So if each, um, if each application is a one-off integration with a two-factor authentication mechanism, it's basically a non-starter. And that's where we've been at for the last 15 years. Um, and it's interesting because we, we connected so quickly um, on the internet. We had HTTP, we had DNS, we have um, email, and we have all these protocols, SSL, um, why is why is authentication? Why did that lag in the internet for so long? And the um, the answer is well, it was hard. Um, but the other answer is is that there have been a number of of shifts in the technology landscape that have just totally thrown authentication for a loop. Um, you know, going back to the '90s, we had Radius and LDAP and Kerberos, um, and then we had this huge paradigm shift around 2000 called the web. And everyone's like, oh, okay, we need to do authentication on the web. And then we had an explosion of authentication protocols for the web. We had old versions of OpenID, old versions of OAuth. We had, um, um, I don't know, Microsoft, like WS Star. Um, we had SAML. And then, so everything looked great. We had web authentication. Maybe SAML was emerging as one of the better used ones. And then in 2007, we had the iPhone came out. And basically, all of our assumptions about the web were like out the window. So, okay, here's a use case which none of the authentication protocols considered. Mobile, a mobile app calling like APIs. It just wasn't in the design. There was also another shift at the same time away from SOAP XML towards JSON REST. So basically, um, had a solution, um, um, then everything got you know redone, took another five years. You, you add up all of those like um, delays, and in 2015, we get a JSON REST standard that supports mobile for authentication called OpenID Connect. And it sort of looks like the most promising one right now. Um, so, okay, conclusions. Um, as I said, we have plenty of ways to authenticate a person. Um, one of the other things I like to point out is that um, there's, there'll never be one Uber authentication mechanism that's right for all situations. So depending upon the device that you have in your hands, one authentication technology might fit better than another. So if you're an organization, you need to think about supporting multiple different workflows for different types of authentication and for mitigating different amounts of risk depending upon the transaction um, that, you're, um, um, that, you're, that you're performing. And um, I, I, maybe I'm just a nonconformist, but I, I'm not in the anti-password camp. 
I don't want to throw out passwords. Passwords are a really good like cognitive authentication mechanism. It has a lot of entropy, and people understand them. So I don't want to throw out passwords. Um, I think that um, what, do we, what I want to see is that, um, that there's a, a path towards um, better types of authentication when it's needed. Um, ideally, I would like to use no types of authentication. I just want to walk up and I want the computer or my mobile device to know it's me and never ask me anything. That's the ideal situation. But under certain circumstances, I'm okay with passwords. And in certain circumstances, I want something even better. I want to pull out my token. Anybody who says to you, use two-factor authentication all the time, um, tell them that progress is not having to do something. Progress is having no, is not having to do something. So that that's what we want. Um, so yeah, basically this: deploy stronger, more convenient authentication mechanisms, avoid one-offs, um, and use standards. Um, and um, okay, RSA wanted me to give action items. Okay, so here's one that I that I like. Um, think about password reset or credential reset if you have something better. This is the Achilles heels of most systems. Don't bother with two-factor authentication if your um, reset mechanism is weaker because the hackers will just go after the reset mechanism. So if I have you know, um, very strong iris authentication, but I can send an SMS to, um, um, to, to, re to re-enroll, that's probably a bad example, but the hackers are going to go after the um, um, the weaker mechanism. So you default to the lowest common denominator of authentication mechanisms. So if you're going to rule out two-factor authentication, you have to rule out either two types or you have to make sure that people have two tokens. Um, I actually see there should be sort of a hierarchy or a pyramid of authentication mechanisms. So when you, like, I have a smart card um, from the from the government, so ideally, I'd like to use that to enroll a mobile credential, and I use the mobile credential to enroll certain cognitive methods. So if I lose my cognitive methods, I pull out my mobile phone. And if I lose my mobile phone, I pull out my smart card. And if I lose my smart card, I have to present myself. I have to drive an hour and present myself and, and um, get interviewed and everything like that. But think about sort of the hierarchy of, of credentials and, um, you know, don't do like email, like password reset. That's really bad because um, the email is normally what got compromised. And if you think password security is bad, you actually have made it, you've, you've degraded your password security by allowing somebody to send an email to reset because um, with a lot of the man in the middle attacks, the hackers launching a browser on their remote system, you already have a cookie for your email. So they just start doing password resets. So. Anyway, think about um, about credential management, um, issuing the credential to the right person, and then reissuing it to the right person also. Um, and this is a lead into another talk that I do. That I did two talks at RSA, but um, I always say don't use strong authentication unless you have to. Um, implement what we call stepped up authentication or adaptive authentication or trust elevation. So you you know get smarter about authentication and about looking at the context of the situation and figuring out if you need to um, how do you need to mitigate risk. And I think that's it. And use the glue server. Questions? <laughs> yeah. No questions. You, now you know ten times more about authentication than yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome uh, authentications. Um, where have you seen authentication separate out from authorization? And is it are there things in authorization world that you haven't covered here in the authentication world? Um, so um, trust elevation is a good example of authorization because it happens after you're authenticated. After we think you know, we know who you are, and then you go to do a certain transaction, um, then we need to be more sure you, and then we might create a policy that says, in order for you to access this resource or to do this wire transfer, um, we, need to, uh, we need this additional authorization policy. So, um, so I think the two go hand in hand. Authentication, I, I always tell people to think about a castle. And authentication is the key to the gate of the castle. 
But after you get into the castle, you might have another key that opens the treasury or the armory or maybe a whole bunch of rooms. So, um, so the, um, um, as you, the authorization can be used to set, um, to make authentication smarter so that we can let you through with the minimum amount of authentication. Maybe we just need you to say like, you know, a password to get through the front gate and that's totally fine. But when you actually want to get to the armory and get the guns, you know, we need you to use a key uh, that you've been issued. So I think the two go hand in hand. Um, authentication is really the front gate. It's, uh, it's, it's the first initial uh, um, identification or the act of identifying you. Yes. Yeah, so policies, you want to have policies um, that, because it all goes back to risk mitigation. Um, so, um, so to do a certain type of transaction of a certain value, we need to mitigate additional risk that it's not you. Um, so, and we do that by having, uh, by using um, stronger types of authentication. Um, and we never really get to 100% sure, but eventually we can mitigate enough risk to allow you to do that, that transaction. Sure, in the back. So there's a number of companies that are providing identity services. So Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, Google provide login with any uh, services. Social login, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I like social login because I, I I don't want I want to have my password in as few places as possible. So um, you know when we're advising clients at Glue, um, we say that your ability to prove that you're this person at Google is um, that's evidence that it's you. you. You're showing control of this social account. Um, how good is that as an identifier? Um, it depends on the service. Um, so I know Google almost never wants to authenticate me. They go out, I, in order for me to do a Google authentication demo, I have to go into incognito mode on my browser. Otherwise, they'll never prompt me. So how good is that authentication from Google? Um, um, well, if you're a hacker and I've launched, I've installed some malware and I launched a browser off your desktop on my remote computer, I probably have access to your Google and your Facebook because they never want to authenticate you. So I like, actually, when people ask me like what types of authentication I, I do I like, I like them all. I think they're all cool and they, and they all give me, I want actually as many as possible so I can look at, I want to know if you're, if it says you're this user that I'm expecting at Google or Facebook. Um, but it might not be enough to perform the transaction. What, whether that's sufficient to perform a certain transaction depends on the transaction that you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's wrong with the, the SMS text to my phone and the four digits to log me in? It seems it works for me. I always get it. It's not a problem. Um, how much does the T-Mobile employee make? Um, because if I walk into T-Mobile and I can present them with some pretty bad identification, I can probably say I'm you and get them to reissue me your SIM card um, and get control of your phone um, number. Um, there's also a lot of malware that, that you can get installed that can receive your text messages. So it's an interesting, like, like I said, it mitigates some risk, um, but it's not really considered sufficient. Even it's not even for like doctors prescribing medicine. SMS is not considered sufficient um, um, authentication for something like that. How about the authenticator that's on your phone, like the, like the Google authenticator? You can't OTP. Um, yeah, yeah, one-time password. So it gives you like a a number, and you put that number in. It's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the transaction. So to me, well, you know, um, 
So could there be malware? So the question would be, um, have you rooted your phone? How careful are you about installing software on your phone? Um, so there's a lot of contextual stuff that could be going on on your phone that could play into. Does it mitigate? Is it better than a password? You know, definitely. Does it mitigate enough risk for certain transactions? You know, definitely. Um, is it? Um, um, you know, so it, it all depends on what you're trying to do. It's pretty, is the usability great? Um, not really. Um, so not for some people. Um, so, it, but it may be if, if the user, if there's a sort of a triangle of, of cost, of deployability, usability, and security. And so there's a certain triangle where OTP, like Google Authenticator, works great. And if you're in that triangle, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so, um, well, first of all, one thing I would say is that you always want to know who the person is who's proxying the other person. So you need to know who that person is. And then how do you authorize a person to act on behalf of another person? Um, that's not really an authentication question, because authentication is sort of like, who are you? Um, I know who you are. Then what are you allowed to do is an authorization question. And so that really depends on the, on your application infrastructure and whether you want to allow another person to assume, um, like say rights or access that somebody else has. So sorry, no easy answers on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it depends on what you're trying to do. So NIST just has these famous four levels. Level one is supposed to be secure enough to stop your drunk roommate from logging into your email. Um, level two requires in-person identity proofing. So level one, you sign up, you get an email and a password, but we don't really know who you are. Level two requires in-person identity proofing. Um, level three requires that you um, um, validate with the issuer um, that the credential that was presented is valid. It also requires stronger authentication. And level four um, requires um, even more like validation of the person's identity and stronger cryptography. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, for certain types of transactions, um, what's important um, is that um, that the technologies that we use support the range of trust models um, from um, from low to high. Um, so one of the important considerations around OpenID Connect was that it um, not just support the low, but also the high level like assurance requirements, um, which is pretty much government military t um, type of stuff um, at, at the highest levels. Um, I'll tell you that for corporate use, um, very few, most corporations are level between doing level two and level three for most even internal transactions. Um, so very few companies have the identity management and um, processes in place and the um, um, chain of custody that you need in issuing the credentials to achieve these high levels of assurance. Um, but it's not, it's not warranted either for the most part for what the, what the employees are doing. Um, so, um, but, you know, the, um, the, I th what I would say, though, is that a lot of the regulations around um, crypto are um, old. And, um, for example, you might say that a FIDO token with a private key um, could be as good as maybe a smart card if it was issued properly. Um, but the rules um, are lagging um, the regular the technology. Like the technology has evolved so rapidly. Like we didn't have elliptical curve crypto um, when they wrote the rules, and now we do. And that's what those tokens use because the keys are smaller and the processing power is less on mobile. So I think one of the challenges is is like the rules around what people are allowed to do to make legally bind, binding digital like transactions are were written like years ago. Um, but um, so there's sort of tools and rules, and our tools for doing this are outpacing our ability to make rules for it. That's the only thing I'll say. Well, 
most of the the applications for that are are involve PKI like digital like X509 certificates and um, in Europe they have regulations around um, what's required for digital signing and they're moving away from documents and so I think it's happening but it's mostly happening with the older technology and it's going to take the rules will take really long time the rules situations bad and the and the direction is bad just if you heard Obama's South by talk um, you can understand um, he basically was trying to not arguing against crypto or trying to find a way to um, industry and the government to come together, which I don't know what that way is. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. So there, there's, there's, and the, there's, I think, a lot of work to be done in the rules area, and the people making the rules um, uh, are having a hard time with understanding what the tools are and what the challenges are. So I'm getting the. the all right. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, that's...